Hello, and thanks for joining us today. I'm Rob Galford, and I'll be moderating our discussion on reevaluating short and long term incentive plans during a crisis. For the past two months, boards and management teams have been working overtime to react quickly and to get a grasp on the business impact of the coronavirus. For the most part, organizations such as yours have undoubtedly been focused on the immediate business concerns, including employee safety and financial viability. Up to this point, any compensation-related actions for the companies that have been severely impacted have largely focused on cost reductions. But compensation committees are likely to begin, if they haven't already, started to evaluate their current executive incentive plans to understand if they align to our new reality. So Terry Newth and David Rangham from Perlmeyer's Boston office are going to help us think about evaluation criteria for both short and long-term incentives, how to make changes if warranted, and what the changes of those cha of what the implications of those changes might be down the road. Uh, before we get going with our friends from Perlmeyer, let me turn it over to Sienna Breen, who is with the NACD education team, to cover some, cover some of our housekeeping items. Thank you, Rob. Um, as, as you said, we have a few housekeeping announcements before we get started. In the top right corner of your webinar console, you can submit a question to be answered by our speakers during the program, time permitting. Please note that if you submit a question, you will be opted in to receive future comp executive compensation thought leadership from Perlmeyer. Just below that, you can tweet live with us using at NACD and at Perlmeyer. And in the bottom right corner, you can download a copy of today's slide deck and access additional resources. Today's slide deck is also available on perlmeyer.com at the URL on your screen. As always, a recording of this webinar will be available early next week at both nacdonline.org and perlmeyer.com. Your participation in today's live webinar earns you credits towards maintaining your NACD credential. If you are enrolled in a fellowship program, you will automatically receive one skill credit for your participation. If you are working toward maintaining your directorship certification credential, you will automatically receive one recertification credit for participating. Please note that due to certification, the time requirement has increased and you must participate in this webinar for at least 50 minutes in order to receive credit. Finally, we will have a few anonymous evaluation questions at the very end of the program, and we would appreciate your feedback, so please stick around at the end of the webcast to answer those questions. And now I'd like to turn it over to Terry to get us started. Great. Th thanks a lot, Sienna. Um, and before we get going, I did want to have a, uh, say a few thank yous. Um, first, I wanted to thank Rob for volunteering uh, to moderate today's webinar. I really appreciate his time and effort. Um, uh, secondly, I wanted to thank NECD. It's obviously a great organization and really uh, helps boards with being more effective, uh, shares a lot of great information, content, and education for directors. So we thank them for their continued efforts. And then lastly, I wanted to thank the audience for joining. Uh, I hope everyone is staying safe and being productive in what is a very uh, unique point in time. And uh, I, for one, am very excited about this topic. Um, it's one that is uh, very multifaceted and also um, very strategic. Um, and there's quite a bit of nuance to it. So I, I would fully expect that we're going to see a lot of divergence of perspective on this topic. And I think because of that, we'll likely at the end see that um, there's quite a bit of a divergence in terms of the practices that companies employ that's going to reflect their particular facts and circumstances. I also really like this topic because um, it spans uh, most all companies. There, there are a number of webinars that, that I've done in the past that the NACD has done as well that um, are generally more geared towards public company directors, but this topic really spans um, public companies, private companies, as well as certain nonprofits as well. So I think it's a good universal topic for directors. And I can't claim that we'll have all of the answers, um, and there isn't some big robust data set to draw from at this point because things are happening real time. Uh, and that's all, that's all okay. I think the goal here is to set directors and companies up for success uh, as they think about this topic. So with that, um, on today's agenda, what we're going to walk through is uh, a little bit on the current environment to set the context. We'll talk through a little bit of the stages uh, that compensation committees are, uh, are going through as it relates to COVID-19 and associated activities. Then we'll get into some of the operational items. So what are we thinking about with respect to current short-term and long-term incentive plans? We'll identify some possible red flags to look out for, 
as directors and companies work through these issues. And then finally, we'll recap. And I will just add uh, one additional note, just on the scope of our, uh, of our topic today. The focus here is really on performance-based incentives that are currently what I'll characterize as in-cycle. So by way of example, this would be your annual cash incentive plan or bonus plan um, that you have for 2020, or perhaps if you have a long-term incentive plan that has predetermined financial or other uh, targets um, uh, that are involved, um, and those awards are currently outstanding. That's really the focus of, of, of this uh, discussion. You know, most companies have already made their 2020 awards, but to the extent a company hasn't, there's a lot of um, work that's been done on how companies should think about new equity grants, and Perlmeyer has a lot of resources available on our website in that regard. And um, likely, uh, likewise, we're, we're not going to cover things like time-based awards like underwater stock options. Again, there's a lot of good material that's written on that, but we're really focused here on performance-based uh, incentive compensation. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to David Ryan. Well, thanks, Terry. Um, as we begin to think about the impact that this is having and the sort of changes that we should make as a result of it, it's good to step back and think about the current environment from a really broad base. So uh, this slide helps summarize some of the changes that we're seeing in the market right now. And, you know, I think what it brings home are a couple of points. One is that most companies have yet to disclose any changes. And then those companies that are disclosing changes, as you can see it highlighted at 9%, the most common change is to reduce executive compensation, and specifically the base salary. Now, this is um, true for a couple of reasons. One reason is that the companies that are instituting changes first are going to be the companies that are most severely impacted. And those companies are going to be the ones that are um, severely negatively impacted and reacting in order to contain uh, their costs and their cash. So over to the right, we have uh, some Perlmeyer data that we've collected around the disclosed reductions for CEOs, for other named executive officers, and for non-employee director cash retainers. The level of the reduction is interesting um, because what this data clearly shows us is that the uh, participants that are being most severely impacted are the CEO and the non-employee directors. Um, but there's a little bit more to this story, I think, because the number of people who are actually experiencing reductions, at most companies, it's not going to be enough to significantly impact the cash and cost containment uh, that companies are going to need to put into effect. Um, so really, in addition to the cash savings, what these are are an indication to shareholders, to employees, and to the market in general that the leadership at the company is interested in um, sharing sort of the pain of the current impact. So as much as it is an economic strategy, it's also a little bit of a public relations strategy. Um, additionally, salary reductions are things that have a known uh, dollar value that you can assign to them and also can be reversed as necessary. So if the impact of the pandemic is not as severe, as companies expect, then I think what we can expect to see is that these begin to be reversed quickly. What we'll be talking about during the rest of the presentation are the annual and long-term incentives. We have yet to see significant changes to many of these programs, but that's largely because uh, their scope is a little bit wider, and so we expect to see more of these changes start to be disclosed as we approach the end of the year. So as you think about how to address your compensation program, one of the things that you're going to need to assess is the degree of impact that your organization is having from COVID-19. We have put together four broad categories here, ranging from severely negatively impacted, for example, brick and mortar retail organizations, to positively impacted organizations, like companies making personal protective equipment. And the degree of response and the degree of the impact should largely be in line in each of these categories. So in severely negatively impacted companies, 
you're seeing significant layoffs, uh, cuts to executive salaries, cuts to board cash, as well as applications for government assistance. In the moderately negatively impacted category, for example, con uh, consumer staples, here we're having a little bit more of a wait and see approach. Uh, there are some cost containment measures being taken, uh, hiring freezes, merit freezes, maybe some small targeted layoffs. Um, and they also are beginning to realize that their incentive goals may be outdated, but probably have yet to take any actions around that. There are also neutrally impacted companies, such as pre-commercial biotech, that are a little bit insulated from the market. Here, they're going to be focusing on supporting a remote workforce, um, evaluating non-critical investments, but really just waiting to see uh, how deep and broad the impact of the pandemic is. And then finally, we have positively impacted companies, such as personal protective equipment makers, who are actively recruiting, potentially offering special incentives, as well as identifying who the retention risks might be. Now, all of these categories of companies are going to have uh, their own considerations that they need to make. From severely negative, uh, where they're going to be considering whether it's appropriate to pay out any incentives at all, to positively impacted companies, where there may be an argument that the level of performance the company has achieved this year is a result of the environment rather than a result of the individual decisions and strategies that the corporation has put into effect. So as you begin to approach your annual and long-term incentive plan, it's important to think about not only uh, the sort of specific dollar impact, but also broadly how you fit into this overall assessment. And in fact, uh, we'd like to kind of get a sense of, of the meeting where you folks are. We know there are literally hundreds of you folks tuned in. So what we'd like to try to do is ask you to think about your company. And if you represent or you're sitting on more than one board, um, pick one as the primary company and then help us out a little bit. You can start to, to fill this out immediately in terms of what bucket is on the response mechanism. Uh, what bucket is your company in? Is it severely negatively impacted, as Dave described? Is it moderately negatively impacted, as he described? Is it neutrally impacted, that one that says, uh, like, for example, a pre-commercial biotech, or is it even positively impacted? Not just the PPE maker, perhaps, but reading, in fact, today, the folks at Instacart look like they are really struggling to keep up with the increased demand, and that would that will probably translate into positive impact. So where are you folks right now? That's what we'd like to know. And as that process is going on and we're getting the results coming in, uh, it may be helpful to get a sense from uh, David and Terry what you folks are seeing uh, among your clients. Uh, are you getting calls across the board? Uh, what are you, what, what's your finger on the pulse saying? Yeah, this is Terry. I, I, I'd say I would expect that most uh, companies are going to be in the severely or moderately. I think that the largest percent will be moderately. You'll have a healthy percent and severely. I would expect there are very few companies that are neutral. Even in pre-commercial biotech, there are some implications of COVID-19. And so mm -hmm. I'd expect a very small percent there. And then uh, likewise, a small percent in terms of positively impacted. But, but we'll see, right. see what the audience says. Okay. And I guess, that in fact, entities may actually sort of subdivide a little bit and say, gee, they're operationally impacted to how we do business and the financially or performance impacts, which may be substantial or significant. And, and they may right. be able to say we can cope just fine, but it's going to be a hit to revenue or our revenue is okay, but we've had to change our operating model. So yeah, good point. try to figure that out. Yeah. Okay. And I think it would be helpful if we could I, look at the results um, at some point. I'm sorry, uh, did you have a comment, David? Oh, I was just going to say that I think also we need to think about the sort of time horizon that we're discussing. Right. So there's going to be a number of companies that are only moderately negatively impacted in the shorthand, but depending how long the pandemic and the um, sort of uh, policies in place continue, that may stretch and shift them more to severely negatively right. impacted right. over I time. Think that, that third, right, that third dimension will be there. But certainly if we look at the current snapshot results, we see that 17% uh, uh, are severely negatively impacted, which is you know, clearly the most 
a category that creates the most difficulty in terms of management, be it financial or operational, on that moderate category, and of 60%. So the two of those, just quickly put together, to just to sort of a net neutral, net negative, are showing a substantial impact. Certainly more than three quarters are saying, this is at least touching me in a negative way, and 20% are saying, one of five saying, look, this is, this is really severe. Uh, and as, again, as you folks predicted, those with positive impact are, you know, that 3.6 is not a huge number. Uh, but right, that's a happier set of problems, I guess. Harry, what do you think? I'm actually, I'm, I was surprised that the neutrally impacted, yeah. I think that maybe it gets back to your point around the, the distinction between operational impact versus financial impact. And maybe, David, to your point around the time horizon as well. But I would, I would have expected fewer um, respondents in that category, and maybe they would have been dispersed across the other categories. So this is the, yeah, the stages of um, the compensation committee. And so, um, you know, we, we had this, this whole pandemic arise right around the March timeframe. It really started to accelerate. And so the first couple of months from my perspective were really around, as uh, David started to mention, um, things like cost containment, cost reduction, those that were very severely impacted considered severance or furloughs to defray cost, certainly hiring freezes. There's been a lot of work on the communication side, and that spans employee communication, shareholder, investor communication, um, and so quite a bit of work around communicating to the various constituencies um, what, what's going on. And then obviously emergency planning as well. So not only things like succession planning, but also like how do we actually run a business under this uh, new set of operating protocols. So there was quite a bit of work that was really core to the business done in the first couple months. And now I think we're going to shift towards obviously monitoring of all those things and continuing to evaluate um, the decisions that were made in the first couple months. But we're going to start to shift to things like in, in evaluating outstanding incentive cycles, as well as things like employee engagement. I, I, I would sense that compensation committees are going to want to have a better finger on the pulse as to how the employees are doing uh, in this new environment. Um, but certainly the focus here for this discussion is going to be around that uh, incentives evaluation piece. And I think that will transpire over the next few months. And then certainly um, the back half of the year, there'll be, again, continued monitoring. To the extent that we start to emerge um, and have better visibility, we might start to see committees look into things like leadership assessment. How did we do over the past uh, six months in terms of leading through um, this challenge? And then there'll be a whole new separate set of issues around comp planning for, for 2021. Sure. Which is indeed the question, the, the open-ended. And what we'd love to do, I think, really, is to get a sense, again, another sense of, of the folks who are on the call with us, uh, to find out how your company is doing in this in terms of what they are doing. Has your company started to discuss, or are they discussing how to treat those incentive cycles uh, in the light of COVID-19? Things like the 2020 bonus plan, things like uh, performance stock unit grants from, you know, one year, one year, you know, two years, three years kinds of things. So the question for you folks is ask just to give us a sense of where you are at this point. Um, are you going to be making some changes? Are you saying not yet? Are uh, you saying, yeah, we're going to, but we haven't actually taken the action yet. We talked about it, but we haven't taken the action yet. Or it's, yep, talked about, action taken. So where do you folks lie in this? How much activity have you put in there in addition to how much thought? Um, is this going to be one you're going to be able to hold up? Or is it going to be one say, you know, we're on the edge looking across the mountains uh, or the hills or the valleys. Uh, yeah, we, we've made our, our conversations. We haven't taken the action yet. Or are you already there? So when we can get a sense of that, um, we'll, uh, we'll be interested in, in seeing that. Um, Terry and, and um, David, are you folks seeing in your conversations with people, are they saying, are they curious to know when others are making a move? Do they want to not jump too quickly or jump uh, or, or be aggressive? What's your what's your finger on the pulse on that question? Yeah, this this is Terry. I, I would say, um, it, yeah, there's a lot of, um, you know, desire to have a, a sense as to what's going on in the marketplace. And there's, um, you know, some patterns that I guess started to emerge, but it's still very early to tell. And um, so it's, it's very hard to, to guide committees and, based on, you know, like I said, robust data sets. Uh, so it's, it's really more around the particular facts and circumstances of, 
of your company and what's the right thing to do. And we're, we're going to get into some of that later on around what are some of the guiding principles that committees should operate under and some of the ways you could think about it. But, but my sense would right. be um, uh, that companies are going to plan to look at this, but they have not yet taken action on it. And, and certainly, as one of our attendees has pointed out, clearly it depends on when your year is. I suspect if people are on a calendar year kind of accounting approach, it looks like one thing. And if they are on a fiscal, you know, mid-year fiscal, and a lot of the not-for-profits may be operating on that. Certainly the academic institutions, you know, may be operating on a June 30 kind of calendar as opposed to a, a December 31. So, you know, that, that may be a factor a as well. Yeah. yeah, they time it a little bit. Um, well, it'll be interesting to see what these results actually do look like, uh, where folks are in the action. And I think what you see uh, quickly is there are relatively few who are uh, saying, no, you know, not going to, we're going to hold fast. And then clearly either we've uh, going to think about this, not yet, which is keeping our powder dry a little bit is uh, not that far from, yeah, we've talked about it. We, have just, we haven't pulled the trigger on anything yet. And the last one says, yep. Action done. Uh, so, uh, any thoughts on on what you see there? Is that rep fairly representative of of this? Because it doesn't show a lot of hesitation when it comes right down to it. Yeah, it's, it, it it seems to me like this is this is um, um, consistent with what I would have expected. And some of the companies okay. that I've already taken action to your point earlier may, may have been companies that had a, an off fiscal year, and so they may be right. in, a, in a different position. Yep. Right. Additionally, I've spoken to a number of clients who are in that sort of no, not yet category where performance so far has been impacted, but the degree of the impact and sort of um, where the final results will land is still in question. And so I think, you know, for them, it, it certainly makes sense to hold off. And I think we may see some companies that just sort of take the hit and try to adjust uh, moving forward in 2021. Well, later on. Got it. Okay. So there's, there's both the temporal, the where we are now in the calendar here mid-May, and then let's call it the more broad one, which I think gets us into some of the philosophical, the guiding principles for how to think about that. And Terry, maybe you can take us through some of that as well. Yeah, great. And so um, I, I think this is actually a really important slide. I think there's, there's some great takeaways from this for, for committee members and just generally for directors as we start to think through this topic. And it's really around how, how do we create some guiding principles and, you know, your company's guiding principles may be slightly different or may emphasize one over another on, that we have on this page. But, but I think there are some that, that are uh, fairly common and can be helpful. So let, let's just tick through these. The first one is around this notion of shared experience, and that's between executives as well as other stakeholders. So w what has the shareholders' experience been, i.e., what's stock price performance been like? Um, have there been any um, changes to the way dividends are paid, uh, reductions in dividends? And so what has their experience been? And then likewise, what has the employee's experience been? Have we, are we in a situation where we've had to furlough a number of employees or even go through a reduction in force or had employees that had to, general employee population that had to take salary reductions? I think those are very important and integral to the discussion around how we want to treat outstanding incentive cycles. Obviously, the worse those things are, the, the more constricted a company is in terms of what they can do. The second one is around not overreacting or reacting too soon. And so, um, as David pointed out earlier, there are a number of companies that are going to take a wait and see approach. I think that's a very viable alternative. Um, um, it, it's important to sort of think through visibility for the second half of the year. Perhaps there are some ways to identify some triggers that would, um, you know, cause a company to take action or continue on that wait and see approach. Um, but you certainly want to avoid overreacting to the situation too early, or you could find yourself in a situation where you have to react then again later on in the year. The third is um, be prepared to use discretion at year end. Um, I think this is a reasonable assumption. I think particularly on the annual incentive side of the house, you, you will see quite a number of companies that will that will use discretion. And um, what, what we'll talk about a little farther along is how do you create a, this notion of informed discretion? What things can you put in place now in terms of information and governance that can help inform the decisions at the end of the year? And then lastly, um, balancing proxy advisory reviews with the company's needs. 
So both ISS and Glass-Lewis have both come out and issued some uh, compensation-related policy guidance. We have it in the, in the back of uh, the packet here, which will be distributed to participants. You'll see um, a summary of what their uh, policy guidance has been. Um, but obviously, any actions that are taken that are outside of the plan norms are going to require good documented rationale. This would be specific to public companies. Good documented rationale and reasoning behind it. And I think generally speaking, you're going to see the proxy advisory firms be um, a little more critical of companies that attempt to do something on the long-term incentives as opposed to the annual cash incentives. So, so moving along, I think this gets into more of the operational aspects and some of the factors to consider. And this is on the annual incentive side of the house. So think about your annual cash bonus program. And we, we broke it out or parsed it out into three different categories um, that companies should think about as they're going through this process. The first is the level of impact to the company. So Davis walked us through the different uh, quadrants around how severe the impact has been to the company. That's obviously a, a key input into the, into the decision-making process around what you may want to do or may not do. Um, second would be, in my mind, would be the status of cost-cutting efforts to the extent that you did furloughs or salary reductions. Have, have those um, been completed? Have you brought folks back to work? Have you um, uh, finalized salary um, reductions? and brought people back up to a normal level. And, and then thirdly would be visibility into the second half of 2020. And that's going to be um, very challenging for many companies, but there are some companies will have um, fairly good visibility and fairly good ability to stress test what they think are some reasonable assumptions. And those companies may find themselves in a different position in terms of what they want to do for annual incentives than, than the companies who do not have that ability. So there's, a, there's an aspect of this that's the level of impact to the company. The second one is around, as we mentioned a little bit earlier, the shareholder proxy advisory review, uh, views. So things like stock price performance and dividend status obviously will be, will be important to match the shareholder experience. The company's relative performance, both on a, a long-term historical basis as well as on a short-term basis, I think is an important input into the process. For those companies that are public that have to hold a, uh, a non-binding say on pay vote, What's the history of vote support in there? And also, um, similarly, what's the history in terms of the company utilizing discretion? This speaks a little bit more towards the culture of the company, but you have some companies that um, historically have um, used negative discretion and brought bonus funding down in a year where they looked at things holistically and said the level of funding that the formula suggests isn't right and we're going to bring it down. So companies that can demonstrate that there's a balance there may be afforded um, greater flexibility on uh, discretion going forward. And then third, which I just touched on, is the recent policy guidance from ISS and Glasgow, so being very mindful of what they've said in terms of what they would support or not support. Uh, thirdly, it's just the plan design, which is obviously another important aspect of this. Uh, where is your current funding level? Or is the plan currently in the money, or is there zero probability of any uh, payout under the plan. That's an important input into the process. The nature of the measures that you use in the plan. Most companies use absolute measures, i.e., they target a specific level or growth rate in terms of financial um, measures, and then they measure against those absolute numbers. But there are a small set of companies that use relative measures. I know in the banking industry you see some of this. And so I, I would expect that the companies using relative measures would follow a different path than those that use absolute measures. And, and then finally, the use of individual performance or strategic objectives in the bonus plan. So some companies use 100% financial performance. Others use a mix of financial and uh, strategic or individual performance. So, so those that have that strategic or individual component may be able to use that as a mechanism for evaluating bonuses and funding bonuses in a given plan year. Right. And so, Terry, I know in a minute you're going to jump and tell us about um, short-term incentives in particular. Uh, as we look at this, one of the thoughts that I have from a conversation is just how important this is and how relevant it is even for non-public traded entities and even for not-for-profits that the shareholder or equivalent of the con or the constituent group uh, certainly is looking at these things. Uh, but given the growth in individual performance components for 
management in the not-for-profits, I think these things ring as true for that body of individuals as it does for uh, the for-profit, publicly traded, large-scale entities. Would you, is, that, is that a fair assessment? I think that's right, yeah. Yeah, obviously the priorities might be slightly different and the, um, right. the different facts that you look at might be slightly different, but, but I certainly think there are many nonprofits that have some sort of incentive plan. It may not be as rigorous as having specific financial targets. It may be more qualitative in nature, as you mentioned. Uh, so that gives the company some flexibility. But, but nonprofits have disclosure obligations as well, and so and they have constituencies as well. So there's going to be great need to be great care taken in, in this process. So I did want to uh, just talk about some possible actions, a little bit of where the rubber hits the road. It, this certainly is not a com comprehensive list or a complete list of actions that companies could take with respect to short-term incentives. But I do think these are some reasonable buckets to evaluate, and I think you'll see that many companies will fall into one of these four buckets or some permutation of that. So, so the first one is there are going to com be companies that, that suggest no change. They have an annual incentive program. Um, the incentive um, mechanisms remain intact. Um, and so they, they don't expect that they'll have any change to the program. Um, and that could be a philosophical thing. It could also just be a, um, um, you know, coming to a conclusion that we don't need to do anything at this point. The second one is around proactively resetting performance goals. So if you think about a plan, just by way of example, that has revenue and EPS, absolute goals, um, there are going to be some companies that are going to say, we're, we're going to keep that same framework of revenue and EPS, but we're going to just alter the goals to reflect, you know, a, a new pro forma evaluation of where we think we could end up at the end of the year. So that's really a situation where the, the business has been materially disrupted, um, so the current targets are, uh, don't no longer make sense, but they have some visibility into the second half of the year, and they think they can reset the plan in that way. The third bucket is around, it's, just, it's kind of a twist to the second bucket. It's, it's um, a similar fact pattern in that the company doesn't, um, they've been materially disrupted and they don't have a lot of visibility into the second half of 2020. And so they don't want to try to re recast revenue or EPS um, goals in my example. But they may want to say, well, we have a short list of three to five things that we really want to try to accomplish on the back half of the year for a calendar year, fiscal year filing. And so let, let's set up some, um, Let's set up those goals and let's set up some incentive dollars around those goals and try to create some additional incentive effect uh, over the back half of the year. And then uh, lastly is around uh, retroactive discretion at the end of the year. So I, I think you'll see a fair number of companies that do this. There, um, as I mentioned earlier, they'll, they'll, we'll have to be care taken in this regard in terms of documenting things uh, throughout the course of the year because um, it, it, it's likely that the proxy advisors would be critical of companies that just apply just, um, you know, loose discretion. There's going to have to be some basis or framework behind it, in my estimation. But there will be a number of companies that will um, use this uh, notion of discretion at the end of the year. Okay. And, you, uh, okay. and, and just as you, the point is that, that I, I hope you're making here, or you can challenge me if not, is that this is not a don't use discretion, but just make sure that if the discretion is going to be your approach, that it's well-reasoned, well-structured, well-articulated. That, that's exactly right, Ron. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. I think we have another poll question. Yeah, we do. In fact, and I, I want to make sure I didn't, we didn't tilt the results on that. Uh, but, in fact, we would ask our, our folks on, on the call to be thinking or at least telling us where you think you folks are going to be. Um, where do you expect your company uh, will be? What do you expect your company will do with respect uh, to the 2020 short-term cash incentives? Are you going to status quo, do nothing? Is it time for a reset? Are you going to set up a new plan? Are you going to apply reasonable discretion at year end, or you got something else up your sleeve? So where do you, as uh, people who are really on the, the front lines of this particular question, uh, expect that your, again, primary company will end up with regard to the short-term cash incentive questions? Um, David, I, I, I think this is going to be your bailiwick in some ways. Uh, you, got, you got a thought on this one? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think I think for companies that do have good visibility 
into the second half of the year, um, resetting goals and setting up a new plan are, are very good options because they sort of maintain the, both the um, intention and the integrity of the original plan. Um, but I will also say, you know, there's so much in uncertainty in the market that uh, applying discretion at year end may be the only way to avoid either sort of underestimating your performance and accidentally um, delivering sort of windfall payouts at the end of this year, or um, underestimating the impact and resetting the goals and setting up a new plan only to find out that you haven't quite done enough because the impact of the pandemic has been more severe than you expected. So, um, you know, I'm certainly, I, I can't speak for the proxy advisors or anyone else, but I'm certainly a lot more open to discretion this year uh, than, than at other times. Okay, and so that's not to, not to be changing the results we're about to look at, um, because I know we're going to be, we want to see that. But I think the point that you make is that this, in some ways, is such a uh, a moving target, so to speak. I mean, again, here we are, middle of May. Uh, we really don't know what the shape of the curve is going to look like, uh, whether you look at it nationally, globally. Uh, regionally or even on a non-geographic basis, and you start to cut it in other ways demographically, uh, that I think these, you know, we, we are going to have to probably, uh, this may not be the last conversation that folks will be having about this and say, gee, I thought of it in the middle of May, don't have to worry about it now. You know, this is not hardly a one on one and done. So, uh, no, I, I think that's right. What people are thinking. No. But I, I also think what Terry said about, um, you know, considering the framework around which uh, you would actually um, sort of um, apply the discretion, those are discussions that should start now so that by the time you get to the end of the year, there is consensus among the board about how you're going to approach this issue. Good. And, and, and I think the results actually show this to us. This was not stacking the deck, I promise. Uh, but the fact that you see in those numbers uh, some 15% who are holding fast, 20% or so who are saying time for a reset, uh, nearly four and a half or five percent saying, hey, we may just do a whole reset, a whole re new plan. And there you have that 55 percent category saying we're going to apply discretion, I think, is, is the important setup, uh, again, unintentional, but a setup nonetheless, <laughs> to, say, um, to say if you're going to use discretion, as certainly most of you are considering at this point uh, and expect the world to continue to require that level of flexibility and, and light-footedness. Um, Terry, how do we make this work? Yeah, so first and foremost, you want to review um, your plan language to ensure that, that discretion is allowed. Um, there are some plans that um, prohibit um, any level of discretion. But more and more, that's a minority practice, but you do want to make sure that the legal plan documents allow some level of discretion. Um, the, the second point is around ensuring or determining if the discretion is going to be applied uniformly across the organization. What this really gets at is, are you going to draw a distinction between how the, the general employee population is treated for short-term incentive purposes versus uh, executives? And you, you may have a different um, outcome or different answer for those two populations. The third is um, something that we touched on earlier, which is um, establishing a framework for informed discretion. And so we just tee up some, some questions that a company could consider as a way to frame up um, discretion at the end of the year. And these would be things that you would work towards uh, starting now and work, um, and there'd be a build towards the end of the year on it. So the first one is around quantifying some or all of the material impacts to incentive goals that are related to COVID-19. Um, are there other uh, goals or objectives that uh, should be considered? And this would be more like, should we create some sort of balanced scorecard to look at uh, when we go to evaluate performance at the end of the year? Um, the third would be around, um, how do we report progress? Right, how do, how do we um, have a, a constant loop with the compensation committee to report progress on established goals? And then lastly, lastly is, um, you know, somewhat simplistic, but I think you, you could have a discussion around uh, what does good look like? If we were to fast forward to the end of the year, what would good look like? And you could build some objectives or goals or yardsticks around that. And, and obviously for public companies, the key here is um, to document the discussions and decisions because 
the last thing you want to do is have um, a bunch of informal discussions around it arrive at a funding level and then realize you have to disclose in your CDNA next year that you use discretion and, and there's no good documented history as to the rationale behind it because that's what the proxy advisory firms as well as just general shareholders are going to be looking for is to the extent that you did exercise discretion, um, was there a, you know, a logical path to get there? So certainly the documentation uh, is key here. So you may recognize this slide um, as, as largely duplicated from the short-term incentives. And that's because a lot of the uh, considerations and the factors that are going to go into your decisions are very similar. But there are some important key differences that it's going to be uh, good to mention. So similar to short-term incentives, the level of the impact to the company is really going to um, drive a lot of the decision-making process here. And not only sort of the types of changes that you might want to consider, but also uh, how extreme the changes are. Of course, if you're a public company, uh, you're also going to want to consider the shareholder and proxy advisory views. Um, ISS and Glass-Lewis have indicated that they're going to be more receptive this year to short-term incentive plans, but at least at this time, um, with sort of the, uh, the length of the impact still unclear, I think they're still a little bit skeptical about um, changing long-term incentive awards. With that said, um, you know, a strong history of uh, good application of discretion, um, strong history of uh, positive say on pay votes, those are things that are going to play in companies' favors. When it comes to the plan design, these are going to be a couple of places where um, long-term incentives are going to differ from short-term incentives. The first thing you're going to want to look at is the current funding level and the likelihood of any funding or payout. Um, for awards that have been granted in 2020 with a, you know, a sort of standard three-year performance period, this should still be very unclear, and it's going to be a little bit difficult to justify any changes so early in the performance uh, period. With that said, the awards that have been out there for two, three years, and are getting ready to vest, uh, these might have been severely impacted by the change, um, by the um, pandemic. And those you may want to consider some adjustment to. Of course, the nature of the metrics is going to be important as well. Absolute metrics where you have a, you know, financial performance goal that is suddenly going to be unattainable, there is a lot stronger rationale to adjust that than performance awards that have um, relative metrics where hopefully the other companies in your peer group or industry are being impacted similarly to you. Looking at long-term performance plans, broadly speaking, we see five different categories of um, actions that the board can take. The first is that you don't take any action. There's no change. You evaluate your plan and you see that you have multiple years of performance. Um, awards still have some time to either make up ground or um, have a history of strong enough performance that even with the impact, uh, you are able to you know, uh, predict some level of payout. You could proactively reset performance goals from an existing plan this, of course, requires you to have some visibility into the future, but uh, could be possible for some companies. Truncating and extending the performance period, uh, that could be an option, but you have to be careful because 409A regulations um, are going to have an impact there, especially if you're changing the vesting date. Applying retroactive discretion at the end of the cycle is another option. Uh, this is similar to short-term incentives. It's it's certainly an option that should be considered, but just make sure that you're considering it in light of the entire performance period. And the last option that we really put down here is upsizing future grants. Um, so this might be a situation where there's going to be no payout this year, but rather than um, making any changes to the plan or to the awards, we just double down on the next round. Uh, that can be a good option, provided that you are confident in the plan that you will be rolling out next. 
With that, I think we have another poll question. We do. And galloping against time, we'll probably make it just a slightly shorter polling period. But with that very helpful explanation of, of long-term incentive grants, the LTIs, where do you stand, folks? Uh, what's, you, what's your expectation? Is it you're going to be ending up doing nothing, uh, resetting the goals, uh, truncating or extending the performance period, as David described, applying some discretion, uh, or making it up in new grants or awards, as he also described, or again, something else, none of the above. Uh, give us your votes, and we will try to make sure that we can record them, get them back to us as quickly as possible. We'll wait for our, our friends who are helping us with that to do that, uh, and then we want to make sure we do leave a little bit of time for some questions towards the end of our time as well. But I know we have more to do with regard to uh, just the, as you modify awards, uh, what to be thinking about. So while we um, await the up on this, uh, it may be helpful to kind of plant that seed, uh, David, to ask to, you to start to think a little bit about um, uh, those kinds of modifications, uh, the kinds of things that you will be talking to us about. Say, if you're going to do those modifications, here are some things to be thinking about just in a very general sense. Uh, it would be helpful to see that. So, and actually, one other note on that is um, yeah. you should also consider the role that long-term incentives are playing in your compensation plan, uh, because ah, often point. you know these are important retention grants, and uh, you'll want to make sure you keep an eye on the retentive value of any outstanding long-term awards. So here we are with the results, uh, and it's interesting again that the, just certainly by plurality, applying discretion, forty uh, percent. Uh, are right there in that category. Uh, uh, and it's, what this tends to, to suggest with the 32% nearly who are saying, for the moment we're doing nothing, is that long-term is simply longer term. We may want to be a little bit more cautious about what we're going to be doing, and perhaps the answer is do nothing. Uh, and certainly, considering it's a long-term plan, you don't want to necessarily have all short-term activities uh, be the response to it. Any other comments that you would make on that, uh, Dave or, uh, or Terry? No, that's sort of the way it's broadly in line with what I would expect. Um, you've definitely got some companies applying discretion as a result of the impact of the pandemic, but you've got a large number of companies that are holding back, waiting to see the full impact, and then, of course, you've got some companies um, falling everywhere in between. Good. So how do we think about that? Let's, let's go ahead a slide and see what, uh, what you suggest as some of the, the remedies or some of the things to at least deal with. Well, um, I know we're getting a little bit short on time, so I'll move a little bit quickly. But just remember that when you're dealing with long-term awards, they're going to be a little bit different um, for a lot of companies that are using equity in their awards than cash awards. So there may be specific accounting impact, uh, disclosure impact, and you may be more likely to incur um, sort of criticism from proxy advisory companies. So just make sure to take a holistic view of whatever changes or adjustments you make uh, before you um, put them into place. With that, um, I'll move forward to our list of key red flags. These are just things to really watch out for. If you notice yourself doing any of them, uh, make sure that you are very comfortable in your approach and justification um, because you might be more subject to criticism. But these would include incentive plan payouts greater than target if discretion is applied. Uh, modifying plans with relative goals, which are specifically designed to deal with sort of upsets in the market. Uh, the appearance of makeup grants without ties to future performance, for those of you considering upsizing future grants. Any uh, stock option repricing for executives direct or directors, uh, that's definitely going to attract a little bit of attention. And finally, modifications to awards without sufficient disclosure of rationale. This gets back to what Terry was saying. Just make sure you keep good notes of your thought process throughout um, the discussions so that you can relay those to shareholders and key stakeholders. This is not an exhaustive list, and there will be others, but it's a, a good framework around which to have these discussions. Right. Um, so, uh, clearly, certainly with the last one, with the modifications without sufficient disclosure of rationale, I think there are two things there. One is, because, because we thought it was a good idea, it's just simply not enough. Um, so, some guidance from people like you about what the kinds of rationales are and how to, how to frame that, I think, is a really important part of the work that you folks can do 
uh, with people such as myself or, or the people on this call, you know, who have comp committees who are obviously right in the middle of this, how do we ensure we stay on the straight and narrow, uh, I think is that sort of important takeaway kind of concern. Uh, so I, I appreciate your point. Then, you know, you can't get everything done on the exhaustive list in terms of the detail, but this is one that really says, gee, think about this carefully, because we have seen this, we've seen this movie before not play out with a happy ending if you either underserve, as you underserve these five. Um, five That's things. right. Um, and Terry, I think, do you want to um, take us away with the key takeaways? Sure, yeah. So just um, a couple of points just to wrap things up. Um, I think certainly um, what we've um, come to realize is that each company has unique factors that are going to impact the, the decision-making around incentives. So no company is the same, and the thought process around um, incentives will be different. Um, second is around um, making changes to incentive programs can be reasonable and appropriate but I would think about it in the context of being fair and balanced. Um, and certainly careful consideration um, has to be taken regarding the factors for your company. And, and last, but, but certainly not least, a lot of this is around communication. So effective communication with employees and stakeholders uh, is gonna be critical uh, to, to acceptance. So those are some of the, the key thoughts we had coming, coming out of the, the slides that we put together. I will just note before we move to questions that we did include some supplemental reading. I think there's some good NACD as well as Pearl Meyer materials in here. Um, if anyone in the audience wants to dig in a little more around some of the other um, topics around coronavirus or some of the topics that we discussed today. And with that, I'll move to questions. Good, um, which we do have. Um, we also have the assurance to the folks who are listening uh, that if we don't get to your question, worry not. Uh, the folks at Perlmire really do try to make their uh, best efforts and, and, and track these things, and we'll get back, they will get back to you best they can uh, with reasonable or unreasonable or actual responses uh, to the individual questions which we don't get a chance to address. But Terry and David, there, let, let me, let's try for at least two, three, or four of them. Um, one of them, considering the point we just made with regard to discretion, um, that's a conversation that takes place not just, obviously, at the board level. That's clearly a board and management kind of conversation uh, for anyone on a number of reasons, uh, not the least of which is to ensure some level of congruence or equivalence uh, at the executive mm -hmm. level with the rest of the organization and such. Um, got any best practices for us there uh, in that management discussion area in terms of flexibility, in terms of judgment, in terms of timing? How do you create those kinds of environments where people will uh, say, hey, this is the right way to go. One of those best practices. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think it gets back to some of the materials that we went through. I think first establishing some guiding principles um, for the company and the board to operate within. I think that's a key gating item, um, core item. And, and then once you get through those, you know, more philosophical guiding principles, it's around, well, what, what are the things that we would consider and, and given, given where we are as an organization, what are the things that we would be restricted from doing? So kind of try to, um, you know, make, make the proverbial box smaller and really just start to hone in and assess a, a couple of different paths um, that you could explore. And then it, to the extent that it's discretion, you know, what, what, what are the key factors that you want to consider in applying any discretion? So working through that process hand in hand with management, I think is a, uh, is a best practice. Okay, that's really helpful. Um, let me give you a slightly stickier one that one of uh, the folks on the call uh, has uh, put in our direction. Uh, generally, obviously, things in this environment, things are not heading upward as much as they're heading downward in terms of revisions, or at least in many people's eyes. But every now and then, or more than every now and then, we have retention issues. We have people who are in challenging industries where there has been tremendous levels of great performance uh, or really extraordinary performance. How do, you, how do you incorporate retention issues, which may mean uh, some incentive retention measures uh, and putting in place at a time when the tendency may be to the contrary? Uh, how do you deal with retention issues, particularly in these kinds of challenged industries or challenged yeah. environments? Yeah, I'll start. Maybe, I don't know if David has, has anything to add in. He certainly can. But I would say that, um, you know, retention takes a couple of forms. You can think about it in terms of, of near-term retention. Do you have any 
exposure to flight risk in the near term. And that probably has a certain um, a number of activities associated with it. You want to understand the level of unvested equity that someone has, you know, what's their potential for career development. There are a number of factors that you can look at around near-term retention. But, but I think a, a lot of the discussions that we've had today are really around promoting longer-term retention because it's around this whole notion of fairness and balance and how do you create a situation um, with employees where people feel like they've been treated fairly because um, that can go a long way to, to retention. So that, that's conceptual, but, but I think you have to first parse out between is this a, a near-term issue that we have or are we trying to do something that's going to foster more longer-term retention? Good question. Um, you raise, uh, I know we're, we're just bumping up against time, but you raise a very interesting question in terms of those of us in the boardrooms have, I know we're supposed to incorporate all perspectives. Um, in some ways, there may be uh, a group of uh, boards and corporations and large organizational leaders uh, to acknowledge that um, this may not be as fast a recovery as the public is quite yet ready to uh, embrace. Um, and there's a long-term, short-term balance question there. How do you make sure that you are sufficiently in the vanguard, but not uh, caught uh, if you're moving too quickly or not quickly enough. How do, you, how, how do you think about that? And how do you guide boards as they are right now in this stage, middle of May, public may not be where the rest of the, uh, where the broader public may not be where much of uh, the corporate folks may be? Yeah. Well, I do think that's why you'll see a lot of companies take a wait and see approach. They're not ready yet to, to pull the trigger and make any changes because they don't yet know what the full impact of the pandemic is. So I think you'll see many companies take, take that approach for that very reason. But, but to your point, there, you know, you have, you have um, different levers that you can pull uh, under different situations. So that's why you, um, for the most part, for not only rank and file, but also executives, you have a, a host of different compensation elements and design characteristics and, and ways um, that you can pull levers to help keep that balance between short and long term. Uh, yeah, it is a balance. Um, with that, I know we're nearly out of time, but I want to turn this back over to Sienna to, to help guide us uh, through uh, what's next. Thanks, Rob. Um, just really quickly before I get to the final housekeeping announcements, I did want to point out that we have some appendix slides in the slide deck about um, proxy advisor guidelines. We're obviously not going to cover them today, but I just wanted to point out that they're there. So if you're interested in looking at that content, content make sure that you download the slide deck either now through your webinar console or um, once we post the archive page on our website. 